Hi, we're Quaint and Curious Volumes. My name is James. Today is Tuesday, and I have been tagged by Book Chat with Pat to do the Sir Isaac Newton tag. Um, and this tag is really, it has a lot of fun prompts. It was created by Reading Ideas, <clears throat> who has a great channel that you should definitely check out. Um, and uh, it has, uh, let's see. 12 prompts, all having to do with Sir Isaac Newton, the uh, famed English astronomer, <clears throat> among other things. So uh, here we go. Number one, adopted or sent away or abandoned. A book with a character that is adopted, sent away, or abandoned. I am going to say the novel Twins by Marcy Dermansky. This is a book in which two children, teenagers, are abandoned by their parents. Now, their parents are wealthy, and they don't leave the children any particular material want, but they're left more or less to their own devices in, I think it was suburban New Jersey. Uh, adventures and revelations and coming of age ensue. Um, I don't have a copy of this book anymore. It is good. I enjoy everything I've read by Marcy Dermansky. Um, so maybe check that out. Uh, number two, use or measurement of time, a book where time is a crucial element. I've mentioned this book before. You've probably heard of it. It is The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. And uh, this is a book in which the main character, Hans Kastorp, uh, a, uh, a young man, on the verge of starting his career, uh, takes a summer vacation. He goes uh, to visit his cousin, who is an, a patient, an inmate, at a tuberculosis sanatorium in the Swiss Alps. Um, begins with uh, 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 the line, this is not the first one, but uh, it was the height of summer, and he planned to stay for three weeks. He stays a little longer than three weeks. He stays a lot longer than three weeks. Um, but, uh, yes, The Magic Mountain. It has a lot to do with place, and it has quite a bit to do with time. Number three, Test of Strength, a book where the character has to pass a test of strength. Um, I am currently reading the book Carrie by Stephen King. Um, just before I uh, put my book down this morning, she was uh, sitting, Carrie, the main character, was uh, sitting in her bedroom exercising her telekinetic powers by lifting her uh, her hairbrush, I think, and then by uh, picking up the edge of her bed and letting it drop to the floor. I wonder if that'll come up again later in the book. No spoilers. Um, question number four. Character with a dark side or a temper. A book where a character has a dark side or a temper. Uh, of course... There's plenty of these. I'm picking Henry the Fifth, the uh, Shakespeare play. Henry the Fifth. Um, Henry the Fifth is one of the most uh, heroic of uh, kings in in Shakespeare plays. He, of course, uh, gives that great rousing speech uh, before the uh, uh, before the battle. He leads his troops in an invasion of France. Um, but there is something that he does during the battle, the uh, the Battle of Agincourt. Oh, boy, it would be embarrassing if I got that wrong. Um, on St. Crispin's Day, um, where he, and this happened, they tell us in reality, in the historical record, he... Uh, executes a bunch of uh, French prisoners. Well, that, that's not cool, right? I don't know. I mean, of course, he's leading an invasion, so he's killing a lot of people, but that's that's just dirty, in my opinion. So, um, this does not... They took that part out of the, uh, the uh, Kenneth Branagh's film of it for understandable reasons. Okay, number five. A quest that destroys personal life. A book where the quest is deemed so big, the character either chooses to have no personal life, or it is destroyed. I have this book here. 
is Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. The beginning of this book uh, is set before, set after all the events of, of the novel as a whole. And uh, the narrator is living somewhere underground. And he is uh, no longer really interacting with people. Um, and he's dedicated himself to stealing electricity. I'm going to read you a little bit of this. Um, that is why I fight my battle with the monopolated light and power. The deeper reason, I mean. It allows me to feel my vital aliveness. I also fight them for taking so much of my money before I learn to protect myself. In my hole in the basement, there are exactly 1,369 lights. I've wired the entire ceiling, every inch of it. And not with fluorescent bulbs, but with the older, more expensive to operate kind, the filament type. An act of sabotage, you know. I've already begun to wire the wall. A junk man I know, a man of vision, has applied me with wire and sockets. Nothing, storm or flood, must get in the way of our need for light, and ever more and brighter light. The truth is, the light and the light is the truth. When I finish all four walls, then I'll start on the floor. Just how that will go, I don't know. Yet when you have lived invisible as long as I have, you develop a certain ingenuity. I'll solve the problem. And maybe I'll invent a gadget to place my coffee pot on the fire while I lie in bed. And even invent a gadget to warm my bed, like a fellow I saw in one of the picture magazines who made himself a gadget to warm his shoes. Though invisible, I am in the great American tradition of tinkers. That makes me akin to Ford, Edison, and Franklin. Call me, since I have a theory and a concept, a thinker tinker. Yes, I'll warm my shoes. They need it. They're usually full of holes. I'll do that and more. Uh, does that not want to make make you want to read this book? My God. Uh, so that is Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Um, number six, Questionable Decision, a book where the main character makes a questionable decision. Uh, for this, I will say Wolf in White Van by John Darneal. I have a copy. Uh, here it is. Wolf in White Van by John Darneal. Uh, the main character of this um, has done something that has left him previously uh, wounded. And we don't know why. I, it, or we don't really, for most of the novel, know how it happened, why it happened, what the source of this injury is. Uh, at, the, at the end of the book, we do find out. And it is due to a strange, impulsive decision that still, to me, I don't quite understand. I don't quite understand all the ramifications of what he has done and why he has done it. But we do find out. And it is a questionable decision. Um, I don't want to say much more for risk of spoiling it. So here we go. Uh, number seven, scale change. A book with an object or place that goes through a scale change. Um, so I had this one originally for time. The book is The Waves by Virginia Woolf. This is one of her late novels, sometimes considered her most experimental. Um, and the reason I consider this a scale change is that there are sort of in overlapping chapters. There are are, well, there are, are chapters that are sort of told from the, uh, as dialogue for a group of, I think it's six characters. And in between, there are interchapters in italics that describe uh, the path of the sun through the sky in a single day. Um, and the, char the chapters with the six characters who, uh, who are all school friends, um, they, uh, it traces their lives through the course of, of, you know, a human lifespan. So we have a day and a human lifespan, um, kind of going in parallel, but of course they're at different scales. So that's what I said. The Waves by Virginia Woolf. It's fun. Uh, uh number eight, Falling or Something to Do with Gravity. A book where something or someone is falling or where gravity plays a part. 
Um, there's a, a, it's not a book, but it's a poem uh, that used to be famous by James Dickey, uh, probably best known as the author of the novel Deliverance, uh, from which they made the movie Deliverance. Um, and he wrote a poem called uh, Falling, based on uh, or inspired by a New York Times story about a, uh, a, a 29-year-old uh, airline uh, a flight attendant or a stewardess, they would have said back in the 70s, um, who fell out of a plane in flight when the door suddenly flew open. Imagine that's the kind of thing that happened in the 70s. Good thing we've got a handle on that now. Um, and so this is, this is, it's a pretty long poem, but I'll read just a section of it. I'm not going to read long sections of everything, but um, this is just an excerpt. Um, she is hung high up in the overwhelming middle of things in herself, in low body whistling, wrapped intensely in all her dark dance weight coming down from a marvelous leap with the delaying, dumbfounding ease of dreams of being drawn like endless moonlight to the harvest soil of a central state of one's own country with a great gradual warmth coming over her floating, finding more and more breath in what she has been using for breath. As the levels become more human, seeing clouds placed honestly below her left and right, riding slowly toward them, she clasps it all to her and can hang her hands and feet in it in peculiar ways. So that is just a small piece. This is a, a, a lengthy poem um, about the, uh, the fall of this poor woman. Uh, number nine. Red Herring's False Trail, Use of Codes. A book with a red herring, false trail, or use of codes. Um, last week, I read a bunch of Edgar Allan Poe stories. I am, of course, going to say The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe, in which there is a, a code and a secret map to buried well. Um, but yes, there's a very long section in which uh, a character explains in detail how to decode what I think cryptographers call a Caesar code, where uh, you uh, you just kind of substitute one letter for another. Maybe a Caesar code is even simpler, where you just kind of displace things through the alphabet. But it's, you know, this is a code where um, A is replaced with say C, and everywhere you see a C, that's actually an A. So uh, he explains in great, perhaps you might say tedious detail how. Uh, how to de de uh, decrypt such a code. Number 10, Revenge, Punishment. A book with an element of revenge or punishment. Well, I mentioned Edgar Allan Poe already. I'm going to say The Cask of Amontillado. That is a dude that gets revenge. Um, prompt 11, Rise and Fall. A book with a rise in status followed by a catastrophic fall. Um, last night I was... Uh, watching a little bit of the uh, stream of, uh, of uh, another Bibliophile Reads and um, Alan at Big Hard Books and Classics and Book Chat with Pat. They were talking about a book that I read in high school and really enjoyed called Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. One of the characters, Arturo the Aqua Boy, is born severely um, with severe birth defects. He has kind of um, flippers instead of arms and legs. Um, but he's a very strong swimmer, thus the aqua boy, and he, his parents uh, run a traveling carnival, and he is um, displayed as kind of a, a part of a freak show. Look, this is not a, um, a <laughs> an easy read. It's a very dark, very strange book. But Arturo, the aqua boy, uh, from such unpromising beginnings, he becomes the leader of a new religious movement, art, art, Arturism, I believe it is called, with the whole um, phalanx of followers, you know, a retinue of people following him, um, and the way that they demonstrate their their um, spiritual attainment in this in this religion. Well, I'm not going to say, but it is a disturbing book, and a very good one. Um, if you have, if, if you can take some <clears throat> rather. <clears throat> rather horrifying uh, things done with human bodies. Uh, uh, Geek Love is, is, is a good read. Um, I think uh, Greg was going on about it at great length, and I, in the stream last night, I think more than a few people have added it to their TBRs. We'll see how it goes. 
Um, okay, finally, a genius. Uh, which writer to you is a genius? Or a book with a character that is a genius? Um, so I'm... <laughs> Uh, I, I have a character who is sometimes a genius. Um, this is uh, uh, Flowers by Algernon by Daniel Keyes. There's a fellow who starts out very much not a genius, then becomes a genius, and then becomes, again, not a genius. Um, all right. And now I have to tag some others. So I'm going to tag Aaron Facer. I'm going to tag Noteworthy Fiction, Nicole at Noteworthy Fiction, um, just because uh, he is from the same country as Sir Isaac Newton. I will tag Joe Spivey. Um, and then I'm going to tag uh, Heather Reeds. Um, she posted a very good video the other day about Alice Munro and Booktube and uh, 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 how <laughs> Heather Munro has saved Booktube. Uh, or how uh, Alice Monroe, rather. Uh, it's a great video, and you should check it out. Um, I'm also going to, to tag a, a few new channels to me. I don't know if they're interested in doing tags, um, but I just wanted to mention them and encourage you to go and take a look. One is Literate Hiker, um, who is both a hiker and a uh, book collector. Another is The Booked Escape Plan, who has some, uh, he's been on for a couple of months, I think, and has uh, videos a lot about um, classics and a lot about modern poetry. He's got a couple of videos about Gregory Corso. I have a Gregory Corso tattoo, so that was right up my alley. Um, and then I'm going to tag Mega Whopping Cosmic Bookworm, which is a new channel. Um, that uh, I learned about because uh, we were both commenting on the Heather Reed's Alice Munro video. Um, and uh, she was doing some videos with stop motion animation and said, uh, this is too time consuming. I'm just going to come on and talk. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but so you can go and see her stop motion animation book two videos. Um, they deserve uh, a, a few looks, but it, it also looks like she's she's got a pretty a pretty neat um, yeah, regular human head talking uh, kind of video. Human head talking. Anyway, um, I've gone on long enough. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you later. Bye.